Hello, I'm Joshua of Milestone Play, and I am a professional game master. Today we have a bit of a project to do. Uh, I'm getting ready for the final leg of my player trips. I'm trying to visit as many of my online players in person as possible. And for this final leg, I'm heading off to Europe. Uh, I have a handful of European players, and they all happen to be in the same gaming group. With that, we want to try and hold a, a, a in-person session as opposed to an online session in our typical slot. So when I do in-person games, I like to have props. I like to have things for, for people to interact with. Um, with so many of my games online being um, digital, uh, when I do have the, the opportunity to play in person, I like to make the most of it. So I need to make a couple props for the game. However, I need to make sure that the things I'm making can like pack flat, not take up a lot of space, and then when I get there... I can abandon them. They can they can go home with the players. I don't have to worry about them, their souvenirs, things like that. So uh, we were going to have a letter found, a, a, a letter to a, an enemy faction found in our most recent session that we were actually delaying for the trip. So I'm going to be making that letter. I'm going to attempt to be putting some invisible ink, some lemon juice that can be, you know, uh, uh, heated up and burned to reveal the hidden message. Uh, secreted away in the letter, and then if I can, I'm going to try and make a prop uh, puzzle, something for them to actually interact with, work together. The issue with all of this is, uh, in this group, we do have three European players that I'm going to be visiting all together, but we also have one other player that is not going to be on the trip, which is, is an unfortunate situation, but trying to get them in as involved as possible I'm going to be making a second copy of everything I make for this for this project. Uh, that way I can mail a, uh, an entire package off to them as well so they get all of the, the hands-on stuff and they get to keep everything instead of having to divide it up. So uh, we will start off with the letters and the, the invisible ink and those sorts of things. And then depending on time, I will move on to creating a puzzle uh, if I think I have time to make two copies of that puzzle. So uh, let's get started. <laughs> Before we do the actual letter, we're going to do a test run. So uh, I have a pre-tea-stained piece of paper. I have my lemon juice. I have a brush. And we're just going to do a, a small trial to make sure that things are working how I want. Uh, it is important to use a bigger piece of paper if you try to use something very thin. Uh, when you apply heat, if you're using any form of open flame, uh, the piece of paper will uh, ignite easier from the edge out as opposed to from the inside uh, outward. Uh, so, yeah, we will go ahead and just do a test message, and then once we let that test message fully dry, we'll come back and try to reveal it with a little bit of heat. Our test message is pretty much dry. You can kind of see where the, uh, where the message is, which is okay. So after uh, we all have a bunch of other ink on the page, and then I'll dirty up the letter a little bit as it's traveled around, crease, things like that. Uh, that will obscure this the, the light message that you can see. Um, but even if uh, the players can see the message uh, a little bit, uh, I think that's okay. I don't, I don't need it to be a major mystery because the goal is for them to want to solve it. So we are going to go ahead and take our lighter and we're going to light, uh, we're actually going to heat up underneath where the message is and then the heat will transfer through the paper. And in doing that, um, the... The organic compounds in the lemon juice uh, are more volatile and have a lower burn temperature than the paper itself, and that's going to cause them to burn faster than the surrounding paper, creating a burn mark in the shape of those letters. It is important to keep the fire moving at all times, that way you don't actually set the paper on fire. And while we're doing this, uh, you can also do this in the oven. Uh, I think it's like 200 degrees and just for a couple minutes. Put the paper in, and as it cooks, the organic compound will also burn. But uh, I find that players uh, players like to play with fire if it's uh, if it's a one shot situation. If it is a major prop, uh, they're more likely to want to go safe and go national treasure with it. With the test out of the way, we will move on to writing our formal letter. Okay, now that we are done with both copies of our letter, we are going to proceed on to adding the. Uh, the hidden message. Uh, during the test I said it's important to keep the hidden writing on the inside of the page so it's less likely to burn. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to put it uh, right along this bottom edge. That way part of the uh, discoloration from the lemon juice will be hidden by the fold of the letter. 
So yeah, we'll get on to that now. While we wait for the lemon juice to dry, I'm actually going to start the next part of our process. Uh, I mentioned dirtying up the letter earlier to uh, help give it a bit more character and kind of hide the lemon juice uh, discoloration as well. So uh, in this case, as opposed to doing anything like uh, smeared ink or blood or dirt, um, this, uh, this letter is coming from a holy order. So I'm going to grind up a little bit of uh, blue chalk and then I'm going to take some of our scraps from earlier. I'm going to burn those down into an ash for kind of a uh, kind of an incensey holy ceremony vibe to some of the stuff that might have gotten smeared on the letter over the past couple weeks. So I will just kind of lightly scatter our chalk and ash concoction. And I'm not really gonna be smearing it too much. I'm gonna put a little bit of pressure on top, but I don't want there to be big smears. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take a paper towel, press down, press down, move it, press down, and this is just about getting a little discoloration in there that is different from the tea stain. Uh, I don't want this to look like we took it to like a chalkboard. There's that one, and then as I continue to work with this, uh, all of this stuff is going to slowly work out as well. Fall off, uh, disperse, and become less, uh, less dense. So yeah, as we work, that will clear up a bit as well. Our next step is going to be to fold the letter, get it all bound up as if it had been delivered, and then we're actually going to open it back up again because this letter will have already been read by the NPC. So we're going to get this all folded up, sealed, and then undo it. That way it is in a, uh, a realistic state for the moment in time that the player characters will be finding it. Now, some of you might be asking, Josh, why didn't you use a seal? Well, I only have a couple seals. None of them were appropriate for this moment in the story. And really, since the point of a seal is to prove that the letter hasn't been opened yet, and we are deliberately opening it, I don't think the seal was a step that needed to happen. So we have the broken wax as that goes around. Uh, this we will keep bound with the letter. Um, and actually I'll probably take a little bit more wax and stick it on there so it stays in place. But yeah, we're doing this utilitarian function in a day as opposed to something perfect over three or four days. So we will open that one up as well. And then, yeah, I will go ahead and just do a, like a, a, a small tag seal on each of these to keep the ribbon in place uh, just for prop maintenance. And then, yeah, we will be good to rough this thing up a bit more and be done. Okay, we have the letters done. They're pretty messed up. The ribbons have been sealed, unsealed, and then tagged back on uh, with just a little bit of excess shellac. That way we know that's gonna stay on to maintain the prop. Uh, shellac as a sealing wax is uh, ex extremely brittle. Uh, that's one of the reasons you use it because it's hard to tamper because it, it breaks so much. Um, in that case, it's doing its job. So we have our little messed up letter. Uh, we do have uh, the invisible ink over to the side. You can kind of see it, which once again, I'm fine with. Um, anything that will help the players get to that uh, conclusion a little bit faster, uh, since this is a single in-person session. Uh, I have done invisible ink in the past on a letter and just let it set. Um, it was slightly more disguised and I just let it set for months and months until they realized, oh, we need to do this. Uh, if this doesn't take months and months, if they like see and go, oh wait, there's something there, I'm okay with that. So there is uh, the first copy and then our second copy. Actually, our second copy is a little bit harder to see on all of that. It's a bit dirtier from all the stuff we've done to it. So maybe that'll be the one that goes to multiple players. And then the one that goes to a single player will have a little bit more of the obvious. Uh, and if that gives them a chance to uh, get in on the, on the conversation a bit more because they can see things the others can't, all the better. Didn't plan that, but that seems to be a, a very good way to facilitate uh, the mix of online and in-person Play. Okay, so that's the end of this part. I will have to package up this uh, uh, secondary letter uh, for the one that it needs to be mailed to. Uh, depending on what the uh, the little red bar at the bottom of the video 
player it looks like right now. This might be partway through the, the video or we might have a while to go. Depending, it might be building another puzzle or it might be uh, seeing what happens in person. You will very quickly find out. I'll only find out as time continues on. Okay, the letters are done. So now we're gonna move on to trying to make a puzzle. So don't want this to be too difficult, but I want them to have pieces to interact with. So I was thinking doing uh, kind of an astrology puzzle. Uh, the, the enemy faction that they're working against, one of them is a uh, kind of an Oath of Watchers paladin uh, overseeing the world, protecting the world from the great evil things that aren't supposed to be here, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, astrology having the different star signs, having the different kind of uh, celestial entities as, as representatives. Uh, whether or not that goes deep into the plot later on, uh, that seems just like a, a, a good base thing to start with. That also will give players something that they can be familiar with and gives them a lore that they can kind of do their own research into. So thinking about making uh, little triangles for all 12 of the star signs, and then every star sign is associated with one of the four elements. So then creating four squares that will have the alchemical symbol of the, uh, the up triangle, down triangle, and the same with the lines through them. Uh, for the four elements and then having uh, uh, the base of each triangle having like a little uh, universal puzzle piece kind of wedge and then the opposite wedge on each of the four squares of the elements and by doing that uh, essentially the puzzle is then assembling uh, all the signs into their four elements. The major part is going to be the realizing what the two different elements with the, uh, the elemental squares and the uh, astrological triangles mean and then like for things like oh what what do the elements go together for um they might be able to do uh, ability checks knowledge checks things like that or really just looking it up like as just a, a means of solving the puzzle um really open to it uh flowing either way whatever the players kind of like what they initiate it'll probably just be a oh yeah yeah we can do that uh to keep it moving forward so yeah we're gonna try and make uh the 12 astrological uh, triangle wedges, four elemental uh, squares, uh, and then have to do it all a second time. So yeah, that's, uh, that's eight, 24, that's 32 pieces. I gotta get to work. The first design I had for the puzzle piece base of the isosceles triangle piece was much bigger and bolder, taking up the entire length of the base. But after playing with that, it looked like it wasn't going to tile nicely the way I wanted the design to overall flow. So I went ahead and did a second design. The second design follows the ideas of the first, but by making the two triangles smaller, they form notches in the base instead of taking up the entire thing. It maintains the flat triangle base at the corners, allowing for the tiling to work better later on, as you'll see. Now that the triangles are done, we're going to go in and make the square, and as opposed to guessing at how the square is supposed to look, I'm just going to use four of the triangles, outline the interior shape, and that interior shape will be the core elemental square at the center of the design. And then once again, we just have to make a bunch of them. Now that all of my pieces are done, I'm going to take them outside to give them a base coat of a metallic spray paint. That way they're all uniform, look nicer, and only after I have that base coat on will I go through, add all the symbols, and that should be that. Thanks for watching the video. It was made with the support of our patrons over on Patreon, where you can see behind the scenes content and the development of our own TTRPG systems. If you're looking to join a game, head on down to the description where we have a link to our Discord. You can join long form campaigns, short mini series for bite sized narratives, or quick dips into systems you don't want a long term commitment to, or you can join our Tower of Tazioc. Tower of Taziak is a 5th edition infinite dungeon with roguelite elements, legacy play, and downtime synchronous with the real world. After you form a house of patronage, every week that passes in your life, your character gets a week of downtime. Everything else you can check out milestoneplay.com. And yeah, thanks for watching. Let's get going.